We welcome you to the media ministries of the Gathering Church in the Countryside YMCA of Mainville. As we love the Lord and each other, we're trusting that God would use us to plant a church in every YMCA around the world. To this end, would you join us? We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. and in community groups throughout the week. As you listen to this resource, our prayer is that your love for Jesus would grow deep and your love for others would be seen and heard. Good morning, everybody. Uh, My name is Josh Cousins, if you don't know me. I'm the youth pastor here. Um, I get the privilege to preach to you today. Um, And I'm... I'm, Oh, yeah, dismiss the kids. (laughs) Unless you want to stick around, but I think you got to go. All right, so I was told by my wife before I came up here, um, if you're in the youth group and you'd like to go, definitely get with us after the sermon. And again, um, I was just moved by the discussion on on voting um, just against abortion. Uh, It reminds me of um, just the Holocaust, really. It's just this massive genocide. And I think that's the reality we find ourselves in. If we, if we look back in time and we look, you know, during World War II and we, we imagine the people that stood up for the Jews and, and, and fought for them and protected them and we have like a deep respect for them and we romanticize it. I think we're in that time now in the same way, but it's for the unborn. And uh, I just want to encourage you guys, if there's an opportunity to adopt, to serve, to, to pray in any way, that uh, you would take those opportunities because I know the Lord's going to bless it. And, and he's definitely prepared us for a time like pleasure of presenting Psalm 19 to you. I've been deep in study. Um, we're going to continue our soul loss series. And uh, basically what that means is, you know, all the soul loss down the left side. We're going to focus um, like we did last week on sola scriptura. Last week we focused on illumination. That's the idea that the Holy Spirit illuminates the word to us. It brings it to, he brings it to life, right? We're, we're kind of in the same vein. We're going to be studying Revelation, okay? Not the book of Revelation. But the idea that the Holy Spirit reveals, God reveals himself through his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's two terms um, that I want to start with. But before I do that, uh, I, I just want to get an idea of what kind of people you all are. I'm going to go on a treasure hunt right now. Like I had a map. I knew where some treasure was. How many of you would go with me? All right. That's not 100%, but I'll take it. That's a good group, right? Okay, so there's something, there's not much more that excites me than going on a treasure hunt. I don't know what it is, watching the Goonies as a kid, whatever it was, like that's kind of creepy. I'd rather go on a, like, a brighter treasure hunt if I could, but um, there's nothing more that really excites me. Have you all seen that show? It's called Oak Island. There's like two brothers, and they just keep digging in the same hole, and they never find anything. I don't want that kind of treasure hunt. Uh, it's brutal, and it's like the most anticlimactic show I've ever seen in my life. Um, but I did just hear, I was talking uh, with a friend this week, and that if you pan for gold in Ohio, and you find some, you get to keep it. So I was thinking maybe as a church... We could all go pan all the creeks and the rivers, and then we could fight this inflation. Uh, I also read that in Arkansas, there's this specific place that's called like a diamond field. And you can go in, and you can stay as long as you want. You pay to get in. Whatever you find, you get to keep. Okay? So maybe that's the next youth trip we're going to take. I think uh, think it'd be fun. I got to convince Mike, though. So I'll get him when he's tired when he gets back from Burundi. I'll just get him to sign it, right? Um, all right, well, I talk about treasure, obviously, that's the excitement of treasure, but I say it to paint the picture that God's word contains treasure, like that we have to mine and we have to dig and we have to seek a treasure that is greater than any gold we're going to find in the, you know, the, the little Miami, any diamonds we're going to find in Arkansas when we go, um, his word contains treasure. And that's what this, that's what I'm going to preach on is this revelation of treasure. So there's two terms that that I want you to understand before we jump in. The first one is 
Seasons change, we've been created, our heart continues to beat. It's the reality that, that there is a creator and that he's in control. The second one is special revelation. And special revelation is the idea that the knowledge of God and of spiritual matters is, is given through supernatural means. Some of these supernatural means would be the fact that Jesus was born a virgin, right? The fact that he lived a perfect life, that's pretty supernatural. All the miracles that, that uh, he carried out. And then his, uh, <laughs> his death and resurrection as well, these are miraculous. But even on a, on a deeper way, and to us from his word, it's revealed to us, it changes us, right? It says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. That's like able to cut through bone, uh, marrow, or ligament, or whatever, and spirit, right? So that's like the craziest sword you've ever heard of. I mean, there's, there's no other sword that, that's, that, that is that sharp. So think about those two things, general revelation and, and special revelation. I'm going to go ahead and read through Psalm 19. If you have your Bibles, could you open to Psalm 19 and stand with me? And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You may be seated. All right, so verse 1, we're going to go verse by verse and, and kind of break it out. Uh, it says that the heavens declare the glory, glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. It's, it's the idea that creation is crying out that God exists. It's almost undeniable. Like if you walk in, you know, if, if you woke up and looked around you, you would wonder how all this got here. And, and the idea is that its beauty alone validates it had a creator. If you step down into verse 2, it, it, it paints this picture that the sky, the earth, the sun, everything is, is, has its own voice. And it's like, it's the idea that a picture has a, says a thousand words, right? You can't hear it. It's, it's not in a specific language. But everybody on the earth, if they have eyes to see, ears to hear, they experience creation. And they can't deny that God exists. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 1 that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It's pretty clear. Like, nobody has an excuse to deny the existence of a creator, an intelligent creator, right? Even Aristotle, uh, he's an ag agnostic, but he was a thinker, right? And many thinkers came to this conclusion as well, but he said... Should a man live underground and afterwards be brought up into the open day and see the several glories of the heaven and the earth, he would immediately pronounce them the works of such a being as we define to be God. Let's step down to verse 4. Son. Verse 5 says, Which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. I love this picture that as the sun rises... It's like a, a, a groom running to the front of the church waiting for his bride. It's like excited and, and expectant for the day. And then the idea that when it sets, it's running like a, like a marathon, like a strong man runs its race, his race. It, it paints the picture 
that even the sun, which our whole universe, kind of our, our whole world and everything in it revolves around, is excited to serve and honor God. This big, massive thing. It's the center of, of, our, of the galaxy. It's, it's excited to serve God. I, I like the humanization of, of nature in this verse. How it, it, you can see the joy of the Lord in his creation and, and how he's in control of everything. And I think that's the, the imagery that, that David's painting for us. And I, I mean, I for one love to be outdoor, outdoors and I love to just be in nature. I think it's, it's a confirmation of God's existence every day. And I remember when I think I was about 14 years old, I took a trip with my family down to South Carolina. It was Kiowa Island. And it's like right off the right off Charleston, but it's one of the most beautiful to go. But so I think we were maybe like 200 yards from the beach, and we got our flashlights, we got our buckets, right, and, and our shovels. And so we were walking. I was all excited, and we ended up anticlimactic. It was exciting though, right? We we had we found two at least. Um, then we sat down and and kind of called it a night, and we're just sitting on the beach, and it, it was like a big moon, right? And you could see the ocean still. You could see the beach. And I just remember sitting there, 14 years old, looking up at the stars, just blown away by God's creation and just moved by it. Like, like it finally slowed me down. From, like, 0 to 14, I was going 100 miles an hour. But it just kind of, I just felt this, like, slow and calmness finally hit me. And I'm looking up, and out of nowhere, I see a shooting star. Never seen one in my entire life, right? And, of course, I wish on it. And then I see another one, and I wish on that one, and then another one, and sure enough, 18 shooting stars. I'm like, it was just in control of a Christian. Like, I wasn't a believer, and that moment didn't convert me. It didn't, it didn't present the gospel to me, you know what I mean? It didn't tell me that Jesus, that I was a sinner, A, and B, that Jesus came to die for my sins. So I guess that's the, the kind of conflict that we come to, is does general revelation the revelation of God through nature have the power to save. And, and I think our whole world is a testament that that's not the case. I mean, the, the people on planet Earth worship planet Earth, but, but aren't following Jesus, right? So regardless of the splinter and beauty of creation, it, it can't save. Like, have you ever heard a testimony where somebody said, okay, I saw a sunset, I saw a sunrise, or I saw the mountains in Colorado and I gave my life to Jesus. And I, and I understood the gospel, right? It's never happened. Maybe for someone in the audience. But um, why can't general revelation save? Creation itself cannot save. The best revelation it provides is agnostic at best. It says nothing about Jesus or the gospel, repentance or saving faith in Jesus. The greatest conclusion we can come to is that there is an intelligent being but that this isn't enough to provide salvation. We're in need of more than just general revelation. We need God to be specially revealed to us through his word. Another way of saying it is like, based on general revelation, you can know of God, but you can't know God. Special revelation is what we need to know God. We need, we need to, to experience, we need to hear the gospel through his word. Um, I was praying for another way to uh, explain this, this process, and I'm sure many of you have, who are married or who are, have dated or whatever have this same kind of experience. But um, I remember when I met my, my wife, uh, I got a job at Converse at the outlet malls. We were selling shoes, right? And it was, it was seasonal, so it was during like the whole Black Friday rush. And I remember going in, it was like, it was like get hired, do your paperwork, hurry up, we need you to get in and work, right? So I came in, and, and there was this girl sitting there, and she hands me my paperwork, and she's wearing the Hannah Montana t-shirt. And, I'm, and I find out that she's going to be my manager, I'm doubting the fact that she's over 14 at this point, but <laughs> just completely shocked that, that she'd be a fan of Hannah Montana. I was hoping it was a joke, but it wasn't. <laughs> Um, and then, so that's the first thing I know. I filled out my paperwork. I was like, this is going to be, this is going to be wild, right? Um, we worked the, the Black Friday shift. And, I mean, it's a 12-hour shift. And it goes all night, right? There's people running in. It's like Vietnam War. Everybody stay awake. Five-hour energy. 
right? And I didn't know, like, she couldn't handle it, but she drank it. And after she did, she looked like a squirrel that got a hold of the, like, the, the exposed line, right? Power lines. And just, bzzz, and she couldn't handle it. So generally, it was revealed to me that she likes Hannah Montana and she can't handle caffeine, right? <laughs> Don't give her caffeine. Um, but as I got to know her, I got to know what, like, she was passionate about, what she cared about, what really, you know, what, what she, her goals, her dreams were. And the same is true about general revelation, special revelation of God, is that we want to know God deeper than just the general revelation. And the only way that we can know that is through his word. It says in Romans 1, 6, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is the saving power in the gospel that changes us. So that leads to my next point, which is special revelation. Um, and in this psalm, you can see this comparison. He, he starts off with this general, with all the be- natural, beautiful things that God has created. And then he changes he, to the law of the Lord is perfect. At verse 7. Let's go ahead and read that again. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. So there's just way more spilled on the idea that the law of the Lord is perfect, and there's, there's much more benefits from that than there are from the beauty of his creation. The beauty of his, his creation says that he's in control, but the law is perfect, and the law can change us. So it, it goes, verse 7 through 11, his word is described as perfect gold. And ultimately what we have here are the effects of being in God's word. So we could go out in nature, we could go look for treasure, we could enjoy the outdoors, but that's not really going to bring us closer to God. The only way that we can get closer to God is through his word. And these rewards that, that David is talking about of, for being in God's word, living in God's word, is the idea that the Bible revives the soul. The Bible makes wise the simple, and I can attest to that. The idea that that joy does not come from the external. Joy comes from the scripture. Joy comes from drawing near to Jesus, right? It rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. God's word is the revelation of of himself to us. Its effects on us are nothing short of miraculous. As I said, special revelation is the idea that God reveals himself through a miraculous means. The fact that we can read this book and it's alive and living and it can change us is absolutely miraculous. There's no other book like that. And the, 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 the fact alone that it's in our hands is miraculous. The idea that, that 40 different men, the Holy Spirit uses his pen over 1,500 years, and it's been protected, and it's remained in our hands is absolutely miraculous. Like Jesus to us. Bringing from death to life, we, we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it, it brings us to life. But even further, every day in our life, cultivating it and living in it and mining the treasure that it has for us. Romans 10 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is special revelation. So my book club, we're reading this book called Spiritual Disciplines. And this is like the most concise way I've I've heard it put. I'm going to go ahead and read it because I, I couldn't have said it better. But it says, no spiritual discipline is more important than the intake of God's word. In the Bible, God tells us about himself and especially about Jesus Christ, the incarnation of God. The Bible unfolds the law of God to us and shows us how we've all broken it. None of this eternally essential information can be found anywhere else except the Bible. Therefore, if we would know God and be godly, we must know the word of God intimately. Let me repeat. None of this eternally essential information can be found anywhere except the Bible. can't be found in nature. It can't be found in our experiences. It can't be found in self-help books. It's in the Word of God. And we're to be fully dependent upon it and live underneath it. 
as Mike has said many times. Um, just to emphasize even further the value of God's word over this contrast, the value of God's word over um, God's natural creation. If it, like if you've been blown away by his natural creation, you'll be even more blown away by his word. Is that verses 1 through 6 in Hebrew, the word used for God is El. It's just E-L, right? It's the most generic form for God. Like I said earlier, it's agnostic at best. It's the idea of a creator. When we step into verse 7, the, the Hebrew word is Yahweh. That's extremely specific, right? That's the deliverer. That's the God that saved Israel from slavery and bondage to Egypt. We, like the Israelites, need more than just the beauty of his creation and the awareness of it. Our experiences, in our experiences, we need the saving blood of Jesus, our deliverer. We need God's word to draw us near to him. And Jesus is the one who saves us from bondage and slavery to sin. Jeremiah 31, 33 is a great verse that paints the picture of how God's word will change us and how the relationship shifts, shifts from knowing of to knowing God and how in the midst of that it, it changes who we are. And it's a beautiful verse and it's and it, and it pointing back to, to Israel. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. It moves from a concept, this idea, and I think we all fall into the trap of thinking of Jesus as just an idea sometimes. We're not thinking of him as a flesh and blood person at the right hand of God right now. He's interceding for us, right? Like he's, his heart is beating right now. He exists, and we're to pursue him in that way. Not as an idea, not as a concept, not as a character in a story, but as a human, that human in God in, God in human flesh. You can't draw near to a concept, but you can draw near to the person of Jesus. And that's the idea that the Holy Spirit interprets the word to us. So that, Like I said, he is flesh and blood. He's sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for you and I. And we're called to seek him like a child with the wonder and amazement that we have with nature, even more so through his word. Um, it's It's... It takes time and it takes effort um, mining the word, just like if we were to go on a treasure hunt, we would probably have to dig a bunch, you know? We'd find a metal detector and then we'd have to dig three feet, find a quarter, and keep doing it. And then eventually we might find something great. But the, the beautiful thing about scripture is if you dig, you're going to find something. And from so my third point is our response. What should our response be to a God that has created everything and has everything under control within his hands, and a God who's given us a law, a perfect law, and a book that we can get to know him with. For non-believers, um, if you haven't heard the gospel presented clearly, the idea is that you're a sinner, and you're in need of a savior, and he, and he is the only way to the Father. He came from perfection in heaven down to earth, and he lived a perfect life, and he died for your sins. If you repent and believe this truth, and place your faith and trust in him as the king of your life, you will be saved. Now, for unbelievers and believers as well, there's, there's three parts to our response. And I'm going to go ahead and read 12 through 14 and look for that repentance. Look, look where David's heart is. He's, he's just been blown away by, you know, remembering how, how beautiful the earth is and how um, God created this, but also how in control of it he is. And then he's reflecting on his law and the perfection of his law, and, and the effects it's had on his life, and how much he craves it, more than honey, right? This is his response. Who can discern his errors? Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Is that what you guys expected in verse 12? I mean, if I told you about the beauty of God's creation, the sun, the stars, uh, you know, how the sun loves to serve the Lord, and then I went on to talk about the Lord. It makes out of nowhere, David says, who can discern his errors? He's asking about himself. Like, who can, can I discern my own errors? 
So that's why we go into repentance. And the, the first one, he says, declare me innocent from hidden faults, right? So these hidden faults are ones we might not know about. These are blind spots, right? So who has blind spots in here? If you're not raising your hand, that's your first blind spot. <laughs> These are the things that we don't know about ourselves that are wreaking havoc on our ministry, on our relationships, and on our witness to God. Everyone has them. I have them. And the good thing about all you people in this room is God puts you in my life to point them out in me so that I can be more like Jesus. And if it hurts my feelings, that's too bad. You do it out of love, right? We do it in love because if we're not, then it's just judgment. But we're, we're called to hold each other accountable. Because if we're not doing that, this is just a country club, right? But this is a hospital. And we all come here because we have brokenness. We have hidden faults that we don't know about. And, and if we care enough about each other, we'll be honest about those things so that we can move forward to glorify Jesus. Okay? <laughs> blind spots. I mean, I'm sure all of you drive. Some of you know. You will eventually. There's a blind spot when you're driving in your car. To the back right and back left, you cannot see anything. It's a dead zone, okay? So if, if you start going into the other lane and there's a car or a motorcycle or something there, you're going to hit it. You wouldn't even know it. That's the idea with blind spots. If you have this, this character flaw or this sin nature, this attitude, this um, just way of thinking that, that is causing you issues, it's creating a collision in your life. There's also another picture. I don't know why, but I picture like cartoon, you know, like a like Wiley Coyote is about to run or something, and somebody sneaks up behind him and puts a hook in his belt, right? And then he's just running. It's like running on a treadmill. He's not going anywhere. And and so I think that's the idea. We look at our lives and we're like, why am I not making progress in in the ministry to the Lord or in serving other people or in relationship with people? And and it's possible that that we're hooked on something. And the idea is that that we love each other enough to kind of poke at them and point out and point them out to one another. And on top of that, I mean, we, the first step is that we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal them to us. I mean, you can be sure that you guys have hidden character flaws, every one of you. Because, I mean, I know I do. And I know you guys are humans too. And so we ask the Holy Spirit humbly, Holy Spirit, will you please reveal to me what my hidden flaws are? You know, what things I do that push people away the way I say things that hurts people's feelings, um, whatever they may be, that, that the things that are, are in my life that I don't know about that are not glorifying you, Lord, please remove them and reveal them, and I repent of them. Have you guys ever repented of sin you didn't know you were doing? You can do that. Yeah, and we should be doing that. Because there is sin that we can't account for, we don't, we don't even know is happening in our life, sins of our attitude, Sins of our thinking, right? Sin is not just the action. It's a mindset. It's an attitude. And we have to repent of those sins as well. So just ask the Holy Spirit, Lord. Holy Spirit, if, if there's anything in me that is, is not of you, there's, there's a, a blind spot, there's hidden faults, will you please reveal them to me so that you can remove them and so I can, I can quit sinning in this way? And will you, will you forgive me of my bad attitudes and my bad thinking, and I, I just give it to you, Lord. So that's, it's, it's the same thing that we were talking about earlier. Abortion is in the faith. Next one he talks about is presumptuous sin. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. And those are the sins that you know about, like that you choose to take part in. Not only will hidden faults or blind spots just cause a mess in your life in general, they're, they're going to lead to a... Uh, trying to think of the, the word, um, a lack of sensitivity towards sin. And then eventually it's going to turn into presumptuous sin, sin that you're choosing. It's a numbness to, to sin, and then it ends up being an intentional sin of volition. And, and we want to avoid that. So we don't want these pitfalls in our lives, these, these hidden faults, to be opportunities for the enemy to come create more havoc in our church, uh, in our relationships, and our families, and, and, and that's why we want to just kind of get it at the root. This is a great prayer to pray, a great psalm to pray uh, in regards to having the Lord cut it at the root, get rid of hidden faults and hidden offenses so that we don't end up in presumptuous sin, heart, way everlasting.
See if there's any way, any offensive way in me that's offensive to you, God, and just remove it. Like whatever it is, even if it's something attached to something I love, take it, Lord. I want to be holy. I want to be pure in your sight. Remove it from me. After David repents of his sin, known or unknown, he asks God for a declaration of innocence and protection from sin. So that's the thing. Repentance come, means turning from our sin. We repent, and then we turn from our sin and, and, and pursue the Lord, right? So he receives, he's thanking God for declaring him innocent. He's receiving forgiveness and letting go of the guilt and shame and asking for the Lord to protect him from sin. And that's the process of repentance. Repent, turn, and devote yourself to God. And that's what we see at the end of the psalm. He says, he goes through this, this, this paragraph of repentance, and then he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So he starts off with praise, he stops at repentance, and then he continues in praise. Lord, I praise you, you're my rock, you're my redeemer. And then in reference, like I said, to, uh, to blind spots, the second point of our response is accountability and encouragement. We're, we're called to hold each other accountable. If you don't have brothers or sisters in your life that they know you and can tell when you start to deviate or start to drift, uh, I encourage you to find them. And if you're a man, I'll be that for you. And you can be that for me. Like... And if you're a woman, my wife will be that for you, and, and you can be that for her. But we need each other to hold each other accountable. Because sin has this really weird way of changing our vision, right? It's like it's the way I described it, and, and just looking over my life, is like, you know, somebody comes and puts a bag over your head and throws you in a van. And, and that's kind of the nature of sin, is it's hidden, you can't see it, you're blind to it, and next thing you know, you're just deep in it. And the idea is that if we're, we're kind of tied to other people, once we start drifting, somebody's going to pull you back in and be like, bro, where are you going? And that's what we're supposed to be. That's why we're all here, because we need each other, we need the Lord, and we need each other. For example, uh, I had a friend just randomly out of the blue message me. He said, I'm surpassing you. Catch up. And I was like, what? Like, that's random. And he said, a little negative attention to motivate you. And I was kind of down that day, you know, like didn't want to work out. I think I'd just thrown my back out or something, one or the other. But just emotionally or physically, I was in a place where I wasn't ready to just go at it and, and serve the Lord and glorify him and everything I did. And he said, because I love you, right? And I said, be more specific and you might change my life. And that's the reality is that and what we're doing right in love. So that's encouragement and accountability. These two work together. Iron sharpens iron like one man sharpens another. Like one woman sharpens another woman. That's the reality. If you asked a sword how it felt when you were banging on it and sharpening it, it would say it hurt. And that's the same thing. Sometimes it hurts. But it's good. It makes us more useful. And I said, be more specific. And he said, the only good in you is Jesus. And you're fat. And he said, only one of those is true. <laughs> and, and I needed to hear that. The only good in me is Jesus. And then I went and worked out. <laughs> but that's what we need. Like, we're not supposed to walk on this road alone. We're not supposed to just shake hands out in the lobby on Sunday and, you know, just be buddies here. We're supposed to, like, be in each other's lives and fighting this battle together because we're all in the same battle. Like, if you think anybody in these chairs isn't struggling in the same ways, you're, you're, you're missing it. Everybody who comes to Christ struggles in the same ways in the spiritual world that we're in. And we're meant to be near to each other. I encourage you all to be courageous and be genuine with, with one another about your own struggles and, and, and encourage others. Like, if somebody says, hey, I'm struggling with this, me too, man. Like, be genuine. Be awkward. And you don't have to. It's like jumping in the pool when it's cold it's like you just gotta jump in if you just dip your toe in it takes you nine years to get in you're just, just you're like dragging out the suffering and misery just jump in repent be honest and pursue that accountability it's called assisted sanctification right we're meant to assist each other in our sanctification towards the lord and you all have something to offer each other and me like God put, the fact that we're all sitting in the same right, room right now is a miracle. It's very specific. 
And God is in control of that. So we gotta take advantage of that. And this is my last point, it's point number three. And it's to study his word like your life depends upon it. Because it does. Like your whole life. Everything you are, everything you think, everything you feel, everything you do is dependent upon the word of God. You will either honor the Lord by being in the word, and everything that comes out of it will honor him. May the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart be acceptable in his sight. The only way that's possible is by being in his word, by memorizing it, by, by just feeding on it every single day. I heard a good, a good, it was put a good way. The idea is like, so do you eat? So if we eat enough for today, could we just not eat the rest of the month? Would you be all right? Like you just eat enough, a month's worth of food today, you wouldn't make it through it. But, and then we don't have to eat the rest of the month. The same is true for the word of God. We can't just read, well, I read like 13 chapters today that should cover me for the next month. No, we have to read every single day. The word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit will cleanse us of our unrighteousness and it will make us innocent before a holy God. It reveals our hidden faults and it leads us closer to one another in Jesus. And if we're in the word, these hidden faults will be revealed to us. The Holy Spirit will reveal them to us and we won't be tripping over our own shoelaces a hundred million times a year, like the same problems over and over. The Holy Spirit will reveal them and he'll remove those tripping points. And I know that this is the question when somebody says, hey, read your Bible more. Like, get in your Bible more. How do I drum up a love for God's word? Like, how do I drum up the desire to get in it every day and to build the discipline? I know that's, that's been like the most challenging thing for me uh, in my life sometimes. It's like, I know I'm supposed to do it, but sometimes I don't want to, right? Martin Lloyd-Jones says this in regards to sin and our sinful nature. He says, the essence of the problem is that man is a rebel and he is sick because he is a rebel. So every one of us is a rebel against God. The reason we don't want to read the word is because we're rebellious against it. Like that's our nature. That's like if, if, if we, that's what we bleed is rebellion to God, right? So we're opposed to God times, but that should, that should motivate you more to jump into it, to realize, hey, I don't want to be in it because I'm a rebel. I don't want to be a rebel. I want to honor the Lord. So we just bury ourselves in it, right? Our sinful, more practical way to shift from what may feel like drudgery in, in the disciplines is to switch up how you've been doing it. Um, what has helped me a ton is instead of trying to read for quantity, I try to read for quality. Studying it one chapter at a time. So... So if you guys would have known last week that I was going to preach through Psalm 19, usually Pastor Mike is really good about, you know, prefacing what he's going to preach on. Study that chapter all week. Prepare your heart. Dig into it really deep. And, and take your time through it so that when the sermon comes, that you get to receive the most out of it, right? Instead of reading all of Numbers, all of Galatians, and then just being burnt out by the time you come Sunday. Focus on growing deeper with the Lord, not wider in knowledge. Whatever it is, just remember the goal is to draw near to the Lord, not check boxes. Like he wants a relationship. And that's what the special, rela or special revelation does through his word, is brings us into relationship with him. It's not this distance no of, it's I know him and he knows me. And uh, the main way that we, we grow in a love for the scripture is growing a love for Jesus. It's kind of like, it swings back and forth. They're, they're interdependent, right? But focusing on the things that Jesus has done for you in your life is, is a great thing. Focusing on what he's done in the scripture and, and how he came as, as the, the uh, sacrifice for our sins and saved us will really kind of wake your heart up. Obviously, worship will do that in a big way, too. But wake your heart went really deep into who Jesus was. It's like the one verse, one verse where he says who he, who he is. He's gentle. He's lowly. And... Just looking at him and thinking about him as an actual human being that loves me, um, human God in human flesh, right, um, that loves me, it, it brought it to life. And that's what the scripture does if we read it, if we dig into it. A love for Jesus is the only way we're ever going to love his word and to get excited to study it. This whole book, Genesis to Revelation, is about Jesus. Every word 
Every, every single line is pointing to Jesus, our Savior. It's a beautiful rescue mission and a king who saves his people from the grip of sin and death. You and me as Israelites, often, right? And we say, man, they're knuckleheads. Well, that's how we are, right? Just like that. So it's a beautiful story because it's our story, right? It's Jesus' story. And, and he, so I just want to encourage you all uh, to live in and under God's word with the guiding of the Holy Spirit. There's treasure in it, and it will change you. And it'll not just change who you are, get rid of the hidden faults. It'll give you joy. It'll give you peace, right? Like, it'll give you everything that we're always trying to find and everything else. It's in here. And it'll sanctify us and make us more like Jesus so we can be more useful to his purpose. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then uh, we're going to move into a time of communion, and Zane's going to come up. If you would, please bow your heads with me. Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. We thank you for your son Jesus to come and die on the cross and save us from our sins and to put us in right standing with you. And Lord, I pray that you would just forgive us of our hidden sins. You'd reveal them to us. And you'd forgive us of our presumptuous sins upon your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd fill us up to the brim. There's nothing.